Now we're looking at Revelation chapter 16 here, brothers and sisters, and this, uh, what is known as the sixth vial in verses 12 down to verse 16, which culminates with the gathering of the nations to that great last battle of Armageddon. And it's a curious thing, isn't it, that the, the forces that bring together the nations, the forces which gather all peoples together to this great famous last battle of Armageddon should be called unclean spirits like frogs. Frogs, brothers and sisters. It's almost comical sounding. And surely, as it is in the context of the return of Christ and the gathering of the nations and Armageddon, this picture of frog should want to make us sit up and take notice and ask the question, what are these frogs all about? Why are they in the earth? How are they gathering the nations? And, and what effect is that meant to have upon me? Because in verse 15, where you get that reminder directed at us to watch, because Jesus will come as a thief. And we're going to see, especially in our second class, later on this afternoon, that these unclean spirits like frogs affect you and me, every one of us in this room. We have to be watchful and ready for the return of our Lord. Basically, what we're going to look at this afternoon in these frog-like spirits, and when it comes down to it, is they teach us about a doctrine extant in this world that is preached everywhere, the doctrine of freedom. But not just freedom in itself, because of course freedom is a very scriptural thing. It's, it's a teaching that we have all the way through, especially the New Testament, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has made us free. The truth has made us free. We are free men and free women. And yet that is exactly the same thing that these frog-like spirits teach, the principle of freedom. But really, brothers and sisters, it's rather the spirit behind that freedom which we're going to look at. Not freedom itself, but the spirit behind the preaching of freedom which this world enjoys. A spirit, brothers and sisters, that pervades, a spirit that is absolutely everywhere, a spirit that affects absolutely everyone through the ideas and through the philosophies that come from man. And so we read in verse 13 then that I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And that's really the, the first thing that we should take note of, brothers and sisters, is that these are things that come out of the mouth. They are things that are spoken. They are teachings or doctrines, philosophies, ideas, however you want to put it, because they, they come out of the mouth. And more specifically, they are described in this way as unclean spirits. And that suggests to us that they are false teachings. And of course, they come out of these three characters, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. If you just want to run back to the book of Zechariah just quickly, just to get a little um, context as to what unclean spirits are from a, a biblical point of view. This is a classic passage to turn to when you're discussing with someone, well, what are these unclean spirits that the Bible talks about? Well, Zechariah here seems to explain very simply what an unclean spirit is. It's in Zechariah 13 and verse 2, where it says, It shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. So you can see the concept of an unclean spirit is connected with a false prophet, with idolatry, and all of these things really go hand in hand. A, a, a prophet preaches about his idolatry, about his particular false religion, and he has a spirit about him, a spirit about his words. His teachings are likened then to an unclean spirit. And then back in uh, chapter 16 of Revelation, it goes on to say in verse 14, 
For they are the spirits, again this word spirit, it doesn't just say these are doctrines or teachings, it says this is a spirit. Now these are the spirits of demons, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, into the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So these are the spirits of demons, and they're working miracles. Well, what, what do you suppose that means? We have unclean spirits, we have demons. When you think in the New Testament about the, particularly in the Gospels, when Jesus uh, cured people of unclean spirits and demons, he would cast them out. And the idea in the New Testament of an unclean spirit or a demon is something which possesses you. Something which takes over your mind or takes over your, your, your speech in some way and makes you mad. And that's what these teachings are, brothers and sisters. They are demonic. Or as James puts it, earthly, sensual, demonic. Because they are teachings, brothers and sisters, that are not just things which people say. They are teachings, they are ideas that get into the mind of individuals, that take over the mind and the thinking of individuals. And not just that, brothers and sisters, but they take hold on society itself and become a part of how society thinks so that they are everywhere in the things that we read and the things that we see in the conversations we have in work with our neighbors in everything these are called unclean spirits like demons because it's as if it's a teaching a form of idolatry if you like which has taken possession upon individuals and upon society itself and has made society mad. Now you notice also in verse 14 that these spirits of demons work miracles. And you might think to yourself, well how, how do these work miracles? There's nothing actually supernatural we know about a demon or an unclean spirit. It's simply to do with idolatry and, and false teaching. So how can they work miracles? Well, we're told exactly in that verse how they work miracles. Look at what they do. Look at the, the powerful effect they have. They go to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. They gather the nations to Armageddon. Those are, those are pretty powerful, unclean spirits. You see, ideas, philosophies have power. Never mind that the power of the sword. In fact, there's a saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. And ideas and philosophies, dogmas, these things, brothers and sisters, have great power. They bring down kingdoms. They change whole cultures. They revolutionize the world. That's the way in, in which they perform miracles in this world and in the context here of this vial of wrath. They gather the nations to that great day of God Almighty. Now focusing again in on verse 13, notice the characters who preach these, these ideas, these philosophies, uh, things that we'll discuss in detail a bit later on, but we need to understand who it is who is preaching these things. We're told they come out of the mouth of the dragon, beast, and false prophet. Now, brothers and sisters, it's worth going into a little bit of detail to try and understand who, who this um, dragon, beast, and false prophet are. And so that's what we're going to do for um, ten or so minutes, is we're going to look at the background as to what these characters are, because they become central to what is going on in Revelation chapter 16. We can't just dive in here and, and try to understand what these things are without identifying these uh, at least we're going to try to identify the dragon and the beast. Now the story of this dragon beast system, as I call it, goes back to chapter 12 of Revelation. This is where the story begins. We cannot hope to understand what's going on in Revelation 16 without first going back here, Revelation chapter 12, this is where we're first introduced to this dragon character. 
And in the first three verses, we know this story very well. It's one of the most well-known passages in Revelation. It says in verse 1, There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, of course, the first thing that we say about this dragon, because of the fact that he has seven heads and ten horns, it's the Roman Empire. That's what it is back in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel's fourth beast is his beast with um, these horns upon his head. And it's without doubt that this is what this is referring to. It's talking about the Roman Empire. But we can't miss the fact that it has this name or this title, a great red dragon. And while it does refer to the Roman Empire, it refers to the Roman Empire in a very special way using this title, the great dragon. And the, the phraseology there is actually a quotation from the Old Testament. We're going to look at a lot of quotations that, that the book of Revelation makes from the Old Testament. It, it keeps on picking up ideas, pictures, shadows, types from the Old Testament. And so every time we read a, a word, a phrase in Revelation, we have to go back to the Old Testament and let Scripture interpret Scripture. And this phrase, the great dragon, actually comes out of the book of Ezekiel. And uh, it's actually Ezekiel 29, verse 3. Slight mistake there on the, on the slide. And this is the original dragon. And this is the picture that Revelation chapter 12 is picking up on. It wants us to draw out the lesson from what we're told here. It says, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of of his rivers. So there is Egypt symbolized as this dragon that dwells in the Nile, the great Nile of Egypt, which is another thing that represents that mighty old nation. So originally then, brothers and sisters, the dragon was Egypt. And Revelation 12 is, is telling us to pick up on that fact and see that what we're looking at here in Revelation 12 verse 3 it's the Roman Empire but spiritually it's Egyptian when you look at the character characteristic of Egypt and its multiplicity of gods and all the things connected with it it seems clear that Re Re uh, Revelation 12 is talking about the pagan Roman Empire or the Egyptian phase of the Roman Empire we might like to call it and that becomes very important in the context of Revelation 12 because it continues to pick up on the, the type of Egypt and applies it to events that take place in this context. And, and Revelation chapter 16 is going to do the same. It's going to pick up on the story of Israel in Egypt. And we think of the frogs. And of course, the only time you read about frogs in the Bible is the plague that came upon Egypt. And so the story of Egypt should be firmly in our minds when we look at these chapters. Now with the dragon, with this uh, so-called Egyptian Roman dragon, this pagan Roman dragon, is this woman in verse 1. Appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now in the context of the book of Revelation, a woman represents a religious body. And this is what this woman represents here. She represents the early church. And she is clothed with the sun, the moon, and the stars. And that is also picking up from um, a symbol in the Old Testament. It, it takes the language right from Genesis chapter 37 and verse 9. You remember when Joseph had his dream and he saw the family of Israel pictured as the sun, the moon, and the stars. So it is a very Israelitish symbol. So we're talking here about the, the body of believers that make up the church or the ecclesia. But she has something Israelitish about her, cloaked with the sun, moon, and the stars. And that 
provides the, the historical context of Revelation 12. We're looking at the Ecclesia in its early years when it was very Jewish. It was really a carry-on from the Jewish faith into, into Christianity, true Christianity. And she is there in juxtaposition with the pagan Roman Empire. And that provides a nice historical context for us. Now, carrying on with this um, symbolism that's taken out of the land of Egypt, this woman who is with child is threatened by the dragon in verse 4. It says, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So we can see that the dragon is against the woman, just as the pagan Roman Empire persecuted early believers. And that provides the general historical framework for the book of Revelation. But that, that phrase at the end of verse 4 is also taken out of the story of Egypt. Where it says, as soon as it was born, that's taken from Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, and the story of the midwives. You remember how Israel had multiplied in Egypt and Pharaoh was afraid of them, so he hatched this plan that they, could, they should kill all the baby boys. That's what verse 4 is taking our mind back to. So it, it's continuing to remind us Look at Israel in Egypt. This is a, like a reenactment of that story. And then in verse 9 we have deliverance from the dragon. The dragon, there's a, there's a great war in heaven and the dragon is thrown out. It says in verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and the angels were cast out with him and there is great rejoicing and Everyone thinks that this is a great victory and the, the dragon, this Egyptian Roman power, this Roman Empire has been taken off the scene. And there is deliverance from this persecution. Just as the dragon was drowned in the sea in the story of Israel's exodus. But of course in Revelation chapter 12 here, brothers and sisters, there is this twist. Because what we have here... Contrary to what happened in the story of the Exodus, is that we have, a, we have a false deliverance. When this dragon is cast out of heaven, it seems like there is deliverance. It seems like this man-child who is born is going to save uh, the woman. But look what, well, look what happens. First of all, in verse 6, we see that the woman flees. It says the woman fled into the wilderness just after her... The son, the man-child, is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, is caught up to God and to his throne. But then the woman flees into the wilderness, where she is a place prepared of God that they should feed her um, 1,260 days. But then you look further on. The dragon is then cast out, and you'd think that would save the woman. But it doesn't, because it says in verse 13... And when the dragon saw that he was cast out into the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. Nothing has changed. Then it repeats the fact that the woman has gone into the wilderness in verse 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into a place where she is nourished for a time, time and half a time. Again, that's 1,260 days. And the... the Serpent cast out a flood after the woman and in verse 17 the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So it seems like there is this great deliverance but the dragon carries on persecuting. There is no change. And his influence continues into chapter 13 where we meet the beast Okay, that, that second character that, out of whose mouth comes these frog-like spirits. In chapter 13 and verse 1, I stood upon the, sea, the, the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. So again, it's the Roman Empire. It's that fourth beast of Daniel. But now it's going into a new phase. Okay? It's going out of its Egyptian phase. It's going out of its pagan phase. And it's going into a new phase now. But the dragon is still very much there because it says, um, 
at the end of verse 1, upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. So it's just passing on the authority. It's the Roman Empire going through phases as the book of Revelation outlines for us. So the dragon then, despite being cast out of heaven, his influence remains. So there is no true deliverance. Now, it says in verse 1 there of this beast that he has the name of blasphemy. And that's a very good name that this beast has. Because blasphemy seems to be the defining characteristic. This is, a, this is a description, we don't have time to look into it in any detail, but this is a description of, of Christian Rome, okay? which blasphemes God's name, which purports to speak for Christ, but speaks things against Christ, and so in doing so injures Christ and is a blasphemer. And if you look at verse 5, there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. Verse 6, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. And that continues on into chapter 16. If you just look into chapter 16, which we'll see are God's judgments upon this dragon beast system. If you look at chapter 16, we see a repetition of this fact that this beast blasphemes God's name. Verse 9 of Revelation 16. Men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God. Verse 11. And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains. And also in verse 21. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague. So blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy continues. Now, what is interesting about that idea of blasphemy, about blaspheming God's name, is that each of those verses that we looked at is actually another quotation from the Old Testament, from the book of Leviticus. And I want us to turn this one up. It's in Leviticus chapter 24. This is what I always like to do when I come across a word or a phrase which is a quotation or allusion from the Old Testament. Look up the context. Ask yourself the question, why is Revelation telling us, look at Leviticus chapter 24. This is the law of blasphemy. What should happen to someone who blasphemes God's name? This is one of the laws which was added because of transgression. That, that phrase in Galatians that says the law was added because of transgression. Each time there was a transgression in Israel that wasn't covered by the law, another law was added to, to provide for and judge that law. Now, it says in Leviticus 24 and at verse 16, He that blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. All right, seems rather obvious, rather... Uh, an innocuous sort of quotation in Revelation. But I think there is a specific reason why the book of Revelation is taking us back to Leviticus. Because if we look at the context, there is a, a specific incident that takes place of blasphemy against God's name. And when you read this passage, it should make you sit up, take notice, and say that is an echo of what we've read in Revelation chapter 12. It's in verse 10. It says, The son of an Israelitish woman, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp, and the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And they brought him unto Moses, and his mother's name was Shalometh, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. Now it's emphasized for us over and over again then that this is the son of an Israelitish woman. The record wants to leave us without doubt this is the case. But that also his father is an Egyptian. 
And this man-child that this woman has brought forth is not a true Israelite. Instead, he strives with his brother in the camp and blasphemes the name of the Lord. And that, brothers and sisters, is exactly the, the story of Revelation 12 and 13. We have an Israelitish woman clothed with the sun, moon, and stars. We have an Egyptian dragon. And we have the birth of a man-child who appears to be a deliverer, appears to be Christ. But if we look at the broad context of Revelation 12 and 13, we see that he turns into a beast. He turns into that blaspheming beast of Revelation chapter 13. A false Christ, a false Christian system. That's what Revelation 12 and 13 is drawing out for us. And so I'm going to put on the screen um, a very brief summary. We could spend a lot more time in Revelation 12 and 13. But just to give you an overview of what is going on, we have in Revelation 12 a woman and a dragon. And we see here the beginnings of the development of this false Christian system because it seems as we read through the context that this woman has been compromised by the dragon. And actually Paul picks this up in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. While we're looking through this, just quickly turn to 2 Corinthians 11 if you would. Because Paul picks up um, the idea that Revelation tells us here and says the same things in, in in different language. In 2 Corinthians 11, he talks about the woman and the dragon. Or the dragon, as it's called in Revelation 12, that old serpent. So it's representative of that great power of sin, which has been antagonistic against the seed of the woman since the beginning. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And that initially is the woman in Revelation 12, the bride of Christ. But, verse 3, I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He's afraid of the subtle teachings around the church at that time that they might draw brothers and sisters away and be compromised by the paganism in the world. And then what we have in Revelation 12 is the birth of this man-child. Someone who looks like Christ but is a false deliverer. And this again is what is picked up on. This picks up on the story of Genesis. Carrying on in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 4, it says, for if he that comes preaches another Jesus. He's afraid of the preaching of a false Jesus. And that is what is happening in Revelation chapter 12 with the birth of this man-child. It's someone who looks exactly like Christ. Ruling all nations with a rod of iron. Caught up to God and to his throne. And yet it's just like in Genesis chapter 3 and 4. We have the woman beguiled by the serpent. And then in Genesis 4, the woman brings forth a man-child. She says, I have, got, I have gotten the man, Yahweh. She thinks her son is the promised seed, the deliverer, the one who should crush the serpent upon the head. And it appears that that happens in Revelation 12. There's this war in heaven. The, the, the serpent, the, the dragon is thrown out. But of course, the man-child she brought forth was Cain, who grew up and slew his brother. And that's the story of Revelation. This, this entity that seems to be a great deliverer instead turns into this corrupt Christian church which then turns round and persecutes true brothers and sisters in Christ. History just repeating itself. And so then what we have in Revelation 12 is the woman who flees into the wilderness for a period of 1,260 days. And I believe this is reference to the Dark and Middle Ages, the time when the, the Roman Church reigned supreme, when the beast held sway over all and was the ruling power. 
and true believers were persecuted. The woman and her seed were persecuted by the Roman Empire, by the Catholic system for that period of time. And so if we turn on to Revelation chapter 16 with these things in the background. What we have in this chapter is a judgment upon this dragon beast system. Let's just consider the 1,260 days that the woman spends in the wilderness. If you look through the scripture, you do see a period of time that matches that 1,260 days. It's equal to three and a half years. And the book of Revelation borrows heavily from the story of Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel. And it's as if the world of the, the time of Revelation is likened to the world of, of Ahab and Jezebel. With true believers like Elijah trying to preach the truth in the midst of a, a corrupt Christianity. And we know from James that a drought came upon the land of Israel for three and a half years. There was no rain. And we have a three and a half year period, 1,260 days period, in Revelation chapter 12, in which the woman flees into the wilderness. And as I said, this speaks to me about the dark, the Middle Ages, in which there was a spiritual drought. The doctrine of God's truth did not rain up, down upon the world for a long period of time. The Roman Catholic Church reigned supreme. The Bible was a closed book. True believers were persecuted. The truth was more or less demolished for, for century after century after century. It was a spiritual drought. And truth was kept in chains. It seemed like in Revelation 12 that it was coming out of Egypt, coming out of the bondage of the, the Roman power. But the chains were just put on again, and they were kept in bondage under the Roman Catholic system. Now, in Revelation chapter 16, then, we have judgments upon this corrupt system. And the key idea that turns up all the way through Revelation chapter 16 is of freedom. Freedom from bondage. First of all, in a very good sense, but then it turns sour. Now there's a clue as to what's going on here. And again, this, this chapter is just full of quotations and allusions back to the Old Testament. But have a look at verse 4, for instance. This may be just a nice little clue as to what's going on in this chapter. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 4. It says, The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. Now that phrase... A fountain of waters is a quotation straight out of First Kings chapter 18 and verse 5. Right out of the story of Ahab, Jezebel and Elijah. It's the time in which Elijah went up onto Mount Carmel and brought down fire to convince people that Yahweh, he is the God. And that's the beginning of the end of Baal. And that was Elijah's mission to to take the children of Israel on a spiritual exodus out of the bondage of Baal into the glorious light of God's truth. And it seemed like that, that was a victory in, in 1 Kings 18. Yahweh, he is the God. Yahweh, he is the God, said the people, as Baal meets his match. What's interesting about this quotation from 1 Kings 18 verse 5, there it is. Ahab said unto Obadiah, go into the land and to all the fountains of waters, this is the language that Revelation picks up on. This happens to be the time when that drought comes to an end. As it says in verse 1, It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. Rain is going to fall. The end of the drought. God's truth is going to be preached. The woman is going to emerge from the wilderness. The bonds of the Roman Catholic yoke are going to be taken away. 
and there is going to be freedom. And that's the period of history that we're talking about in Revelation chapter 16. Now one interesting phrase that crops up a couple of times in this chapter, in verse 1, in the introduction to these seven vials of wrath that are poured out, these judgments that come upon this dragon beast system, it says in verse 1, I heard a great voice out of the temple. And that repeats then in verse 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple. And again, we've got to scratch our heads and think, well, why are we told this? Why are we told twice? Verse 1, verse 17, that this is a great voice out of the temple. This seems to be a very important proclamation. And what we find, brothers and sisters, that once again, this is taking our minds back to the Old Testament. This is another quotation, this time to the prophecy of Isaiah. And you can contrast this with what is going on in Revelation chapter 12, which introduced this dragon beast system. It says in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 6, A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that renders recompense to his enemies. And that is what is going on in Revelation chapter 16. God is going to recompense his enemies. God is going to deliver his people from the bondage of the Roman Catholic yoke. And notice what it says then in verse 7, interestingly. It's talking about Israel here as a woman with child. It says, before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man-child. And the whole context of Isaiah chapter 66 is of deliverance through a man-child. And it points forward to their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would deliver them and bring God's recompense upon his enemies. True deliverance. And that's what Revelation chapter 16 is ultimately about. It picks up on the story of the exodus of Israel once again. And now it says, here is the true deliverance from that dragon beast system ultimately in the seventh vial and the destruction of Babylon the Great but just go back to Revelation chapter 12 again if you would because in fact that quotation from Isaiah 66 is used right here in Revelation 12 verse 5 it says, as she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations. So it seems then that it's taken us back to the same passage. This great Isaiah 66, this passage of the, the deliverance of God's people against the enemies of God. But what we have in Revelation chapter 12, in fact, brothers and sisters, is a designed ambiguity. We're not really quite sure about this woman or about this man-child all the way through. There's all sorts of questions because there's an ambiguity there. Is he a true deliverer or is he a false deliverer? Is he truly Christ or is he someone who just looks like Christ? Because in verse 2, where it describes her pregnancy, she being with child, Christ, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered, that is yet another quotation from the Old Testament. And this time, look at the context. It's from Revelation 12, 2, where it says, She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. It quotes from the book of Isaiah again. And again, the children of Israel are crying out in bondage. They want deliverance. And it says in verse 17, Like as a woman with child that draws near the time of her delivery is in pain, cries out in her pangs, just as Israel did in Egypt. So have we been in thy sight, O Lord, we have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. It was a phantom pregnancy. We have not wrought any deliverance on the earth, neither have the inhabitants of the world fallen. It was a false pregnancy. There was hope of the delivery of a deliverer who would bring forth salvation and release from bondage, but no. It, was, it is a false deliverance. And that's exactly the story of Revelation 12 and 13. It seems like there is deliverance, but no. The antics of the dragon 
and the beast continue on. All right, now back in Revelation chapter 16, what we have then is this true deliverance that begins in the first six vials. But you'll notice in verse 13, the dragon, beast, and false prophet are still very much there. So it's the beginning of a deliverance. They're carrying on with their dirty work. They've changed their tactics by the time verse 13 comes along. They stop trying to put the world under bondage, under control. And now they're preaching these unclean spirits like frogs, which, as I've suggested, have to do with freedom. They've really got on the freedom bandwagon, as it were. So they change their tactics. They're very much still at work. But then, finally, the deliverance comes in the, in the seventh vial, where that great city, Babylon, falls. But as we look through this chapter, then, we see that it is talking about judgments upon this system. Verse 2 says, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So here is God recompensing his enemies. Also in verse 6 it says, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and I was given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. It's against that system that persecuted saints. And verse 21, which we've already read, there fell great hail out of heaven, every stone having the weight of a... Sorry, not verse 21, verse 10. Verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. Okay? So the authority that the beast had is taken away. There is deliverance from that system. And then also, all the way through Revelation chapter 16 we have reference to the plagues which came upon Egypt. It's a reenactment of God delivering his people from the bondage of Egypt. And so in verse 2, where it says, There fell a noisome and grievous sore. It's a quotation from Exodus 9, verse 10, and the plague of boils. Verse 3 where, and verse 4, where the sea and the river turns to blood. Quotes from Exodus chapter 7, and the uh, the sea, the, the river Nile turning to blood. Verse 10, we have um, the, the seat of the beast, his kingdom full of darkness. Again, the plague of darkness. And in verse 21, this great hail out of heaven reminding us of the, the plague of hail. So over and over again, Revelation is telling us this is all about God's people coming out of the bondage of, of Egypt free from the shackles that that system put over them. There are other hints that this is the general theme of this chapter, about freedom and deliverance. Look at verse 1. It says, A great voice out of the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways, pour out the vials of the wrath of God. Okay. So this is the wrath of God being poured out upon a system that had persecuted his people because verse 6 says for thus they have shed the blood of saints now both of those phrases the wrath of God and the shedding of the blood of the saints they're both taken out of a psalm and let's quickly look at it it's in Psalm 79 where we'll be able to see that once again the the point the revelation is trying to drive home to us is of deliverance and freedom. Psalm 79. And if any of you have those CDs by um, a young Christadelphian group of people from England, voice of his word and recounting his praise if you've heard those those cds you'll be singing along with this this psalm as we look through it it says in verse one O god the heathen are come into thine inheritance thy holy temple have they defiled they have laid jerusalem on heaps 
The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to the meat and to the fowls of heaven, the flesh of thy saints and to the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. So this is that again a, a similar context to Revelation. The nations, the heathen, have poured out scorn upon this people and, and they have shed blood of the people. How long, O Lord, verse 5, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen who have not known thee and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and they would waste his dwelling places. O remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercy speedily prevent us, for you are brought very low. Help us, O God, of our salvation, for the glory of thy name, and deliver us, and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let it be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of the servants which is shed, that the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. It's a picture, brothers and sisters, of a nation in bondage, Praying that God's wrath should come upon those who had taken away the blood of his servants. That's the picture here. That's the picture in the Exodus. And that, brothers and sisters, is the picture in the context of Revelation chapter 16. Because what we're seeing here, brothers and sisters, is the pouring out of God's wrath upon Christian Europe that had held true believers in chains of darkness for 1,260 days, all the way through the dark and middle ages. Now, drawing your minds back to the Exodus, and this is what we're going to develop in our second class. And think of what happened to Israel. They're under the bondage of the dragon. They cry out, deliver us, O God. And God delivers them. And he drowns the dragon in the sea. And what happens to the children of Israel? What well, is one of the very first things the children of Israel does with their newfound freedom? They start worshipping a golden calf. And that's where freedom is this two-edged sword. This is the exhortation that comes out in Revelation chapter 16. Is that you cannot let the pendulum swing too far. When you've wrested your way, self away from bondage, the temptation is to go the other extreme and to throw off all restraint and to use your liberty as an occasion for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. That's the exhortation, as I said, that's going to come out in our second class. And that is actually what happens in Revelation chapter 16. The world is freed from the power and authority of the dragon beast system. People have thrown off the shackles of the control of that system. They are free. But then we get these three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And we're going to see that what they preach, these unclean spirits, are the preaching of freedom. Now let's look at these frogs then. It's about time we looked at these frogs. Have a look at Exodus chapter 8. Because if we're going to understand uh, anything about these unclean spirits, we need to understand what it is about frogs. This rather strange, peculiar notion that it's these frog spirits that drive the nations to Armageddon. Now in Exodus chapter 8 verse 1, it says, the Lord, this is the second plague that came upon Egypt. The only time in the Bible you're going to read about frogs is here, apart from um, one or two psalms, which are a commentary upon the plagues. It says in verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, go unto Pharaoh, say to him, thus saith the Lord, let my people go, that they may serve me. And if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your borders with frogs. Interestingly, this is the first time where Pharaoh actually promises freedom and says, I will let your people go. It was a false promise, but it was a promise of freedom all the same. And it says in verse 3, the river shall bring forth frogs 
abundantly, which shall go up and come into your house and into your bedchamber, upon your bed, into your, the houses of your servants, upon the, your people, into your ovens, into your kneading troughs. The frogs shall come upon you and upon your people and upon all your servants. And as you read that, you can just see that these frogs, brothers and sisters, get absolutely everywhere. They get into Pharaoh's house, they get into the common people's houses, the servants' houses, they even get into the food. They get everywhere, they get to everyone, and it describes for us, in the context of Revelation, the spirit of the age in which we live, that affects, like a spirit that pervades, like a wind or a breath, that gets into every nook and cranny. It affects each and every one of us. Everyone in this room is affected, is breathing in these unclean spirits like frogs. And that's why we so have to be on our guard against them. Now here's an interesting Bible echo. The frogs eventually die out of the land of Egypt. And notice what happens to them. In verse 13, The Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, out of the fields. And I'm going to read this from the King James. You might, if you're not reading the King James, this echo won't come out. But I think it's a very valid Bible echo. Verse 14 says, And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. It doesn't take me to, to, to tell you the Bible echo there with Revelation chapter 16. They get all of these frogs together, and they gather them together upon heaps. Now the word heaps there is interesting. It doesn't actually mean a pile or a heap as such. It's the Hebrew word choma, which actually means clay. It's as if what we're being told here is all of these frogs which are made out of the, the clay, the dust of the ground, creatures of the dust, telling us that these unclean spirits like frogs are things which are earthly, sensual, demonic. It's this great big pile of flesh comes and forms a great, a great pile of stinking flesh there in the land of Egypt. And what's interesting about that is in Genesis chapter 11, the very first occurrence of this word choma or clay is in the building of the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 11 verse 3. But the people said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar, or for choma. Okay? The very first occurrence of that, that word in Scripture. The second occurrence, as we'll see in a moment, is in uh, Exodus chapter 1. And the third occurrence is with these frogs that form this great big pile or edifice of clay. And that's exactly what these people are building. They're building a great big pile of clay. And you notice in verse 1 that it says the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Everyone is together, all the world gathered together as one, building up a tower of flesh. And that's exactly what we see in the world today. You've seen this slide, I, I, I don't doubt a number of times. This was actually a poster commissioned by the European Union to describe what they're doing. This is what the European Union pictures themselves as. The European Union is the classic example in the world today of the nations gathering together. And they picture themselves as building the Tower of Babel. Every time I see this, I just, it makes me fall over. It's amazing. This is, this is scripture in the world today being shown to to be true and coming to pass. Europe, many tongues, one voice. The nations being gathered together. And what is gathering them together, brothers and sisters, are these unclean spirits like frogs. Even the European Union Parliament building, it looks like an unfinished Tower of Babel. Quite incredible. As I said, what's bringing those nations together are three unclean spirits like frogs. Now we need to go a little bit quickly here. Exodus chapter 8. You notice it says in verse 3. 
The river shall bring forth abundantly. If you have a margin, it might tell you that that phrase to bring forth abundantly means to swarm. Okay? The river literally swarmed with frogs. Now that's very interesting. We know from Revelation chapter 12, sorry, Exodus chapter 12, that each of these plagues that came upon Egypt was a judgment against one of the gods of Egypt. So there was a Nile god, there was a, 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 a Lice god, a Hail god, and so on. And all of these um, judgments were against one of those gods. And there was a frog god, or rather there was a frog goddess. And her name was Heket. And here are various pictures of um, a Heket headdress, a statue. She was always pictured as a frog or a woman with a frog's head. And she happens to be the goddess of the midwife. And the midwives, as they performed their duties, had these amulets around their necks, which were amulets of Heket, the frog goddess. Now that's kind of interesting because this phrase, as I said in verse 3, to bring forth abundantly is the word to swarm. And the only other time that, that word is used in the whole of the book of Exodus is in chapter 1 of Exodus. In the context of the story of the midwives. And if God was judging Heket the goddess of the midwives in chapter 8. He already did it before in chapter 1. God shows that he has power that Heket did not have. Because in verse 7 of chapter 1 it says, The children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, swarmed. It's the same word. So the children of Israel are described in the same way as these frogs. As I said, this is in the story of the midwives where Pharaoh commanded them that they should kill the baby boys as soon as they were born. While they were under the bondage of the Egyptians. and uh, In fact, this is the very passage that uses that word choma, clay, the stuff that the Egyptian houses were made out of. So what is the connection? Why do we have this connection between chapter 1, the children of Israel swarming, and then God's judgment upon Heket, God of the, God of the midwife. And then in chapter 8, we have a similar thing in different language, where the river brings forth abundantly these frogs, and those frogs die, and then we have the release of Israel from Egypt. Well, what we have here, brothers and sisters, is really an allegory that we're being told here. When Israel were taken out of Egypt, it was prefigured by these first two plagues. You see, it's the river that brought forth abundantly. And that's quite natural that they should bring forth frogs, because the river has just been turned to blood. What are all the frogs going to do? They're all going to jump out. So what happened to the river affects things so that the frogs come. And we're going to see this comes out in Revelation chapter 16. So the river is turned to blood, the river which is a symbol of Egypt. Egypt is destroyed and it releases a swarm of frogs. And that was reenacted when Israel came out of Egypt. The Egyptian dragon was slain in the sea, as if the, the river was being turned to blood once again. And it released into the wilderness the swarm of Israel. And with some of them, it was a release of frogs. That freedom brought forth this frog-like spirit, as we're going to see later on in our, in our second class. Because while Israel were taken out of Egypt, Egypt was not taken out of Israel. Well, well, as I said, we're going to see that in a moment. And so in Revelation chapter 16... If you just uh, quickly turn to that once again. These unclean spirits come out of the mouth of the dragon, beast, and false prophet in verse 13. 
but it's all the product of what has gone before. They don't just suddenly come on the scene randomly. In a sense, it was natural that this, this should come to pass, because if you look at verses 3 and 4, it says that the river turned to blood. That's going to produce frogs. And then right there in the, in the very sixth vial, it comes after the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. You turn a river to blood, you dry up a river, all the frogs are going to come out. And that's the key. What we're seeing here in these frog-like spirits, brothers and sisters, is the result of years and years and years of preparation of gone beforehand that finally produce these frog-like spirits. In fact, the history of the frogs, and I wish we had time to go into this in detail, but the, the history of the frogs goes way, way back to before uh, Europe was an entity. You've probably seen um, these slides before, or similar. Clovis, whose name leads into the French name Louis, was the first king of the Franks. And we see the three frog symbol on his banner all over. That was the symbol of Clovis, the first king of the Franks. Now that is very significant because the Franks were the first of the barbarian tribes to come and help bring down the Roman Empire. But what is most significant for us, brothers and sisters, is that Clovis, unlike the other barbarian kings, converted to become a Catholic. Most of the other kings, if they were Christian, they were Arians. But this Clovis married a Catholic and converted to Catholicism. And that helped bring along the history of Europe as a Roman Catholic na uh, nation or empire rather than anything else. In fact, Clovis had such an influence on early European history that he is called by some historians, the Constantine of the Franks. In fact, the, the word Frank actually means free. And one of the things that Clovis emphasized in his reign was the rights of the individual, freedom. And this fits right in with the historical context then of Revelation chapter 16 and the judgments that come upon Catholic Europe. And so very quickly, because we, we don't have time to, to look at this in any detail at all, what we have in the first five vials of wrath is the freedom of Christians in Catholic Europe. The power of the Catholic Church is taken away and Christians are free to read the Bible and to preach without being under the bondage of the Roman Church. And the sixth vial also, pre also teaches to us this principle of freedom. The drying up of the river Euphrates, ultimately with the drying up of the Ottoman Empire, the First World War, freeing up the land, and then we come to the Second World War, and the freeing of the people to go back to the land. It's all about freedom. And as I said, brothers and sisters, what that freedom brings is these frog-like spirits, which are the spirit of freedom gone mad. And again, very quickly, here's a brief history of freedom. We have 1260 years of church rule. And then in the 14th to the 16th century, we have what is called the Renaissance. And the Renaissance is when men began to go back to the classics of things like mathematics and other, other, um, other things like mathematics and theology. Men started to read the the letters to Paul for the first time for centuries. Man was beginning to release himself gradually from the yoke of bondage. But it was also the beginning of humanism. You see, freedom is a two-edged sword. You could now read the epistles of Paul, but it was also the beginning of humanism. Man had become so small for 1,260 years that he was nothing. And then in the Renaissance, men began to preach that man is noble, that he has fallen in all aspects except for his intellect. 
A man started to trust in his intellect, in his way of doing things. The Renaissance also brought about the invention of the printing press. We all know how wonderful that is for us, the beginning of the dissemination of the, the word of God, that it was printed and uh, could be read by many more people than it could be could before. But the printing press also saw the dawn of such evils as pornography. Again, freedom is a wonderful thing for us. We are free from law, but it also promotes the flesh. Then we have the Reformation in the 16th and 17th century, and men like Luther, recognizing that the control that the Roman church had was wrong, and pe people protesting against that and forming the, um, the Protestant churches. And then what we have in the 17th to the 19th centuries is the age of enlightenment, the age of reason. When men began to think for themselves, but they were throwing off not just the shackles of the Roman church, but the shackles of the authority of God himself, and starting to trust in their own intellect. And this was the time of such things as the French Revolution, which is really where Revelation chapter 16 focuses in on. The French Revolution, when a tenth part of the empire of the Roman beast fell, Resting itself away from the powers of the church and the powers of iron Rome. And that spirit of revolution in the 18th to the 20th century, we have the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity. We have the American Revolution, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have the Russian Revolution, proletarians of the world unite until eventually we came to the 20th century and the freedom now not just of Europe but of the whole world through the first and second world wars particularly the rescue of the land and the people of Israel and it is then brothers and sisters that we see the release of these frog like spirits as it were on street level as we come to after the second world war before the second world war people believed in right and wrong and then when, when the world was fully free, the frog spirits were released at street level in the 60s and the 70s where freedom was taken to a new level. And this idea of a, a gradual increase in freedom over time is also taught in Nebuchadnezzar's image. Have you ever looked at the, the number of horns on the beasts as you go down, paralleling them with the image? We have in Babylon one supreme ruler, we have a two-horned ram with Medo-Persia. We have four horns on the goat or four heads on the leopard of Greece. Then we have ten horns on the Roman beast. One, two, four, ten. It's a gradual dissolution of power away from one head to many heads. Or people trying to rule themselves until we come down to the feet of iron and clay and again what we see in the iron and clay is men trying to free themselves from the iron rule of Rome we have the Christian Roman element and then it's mixing with with clay it's the power of the masses the power of the people people trying to rise up and vie for power with the iron of Rome and that's exactly the world in which we live brothers and sisters we live in a world of people power we live in a world of, that has revolution, it's revolutionized itself through these frog-like spirits of freedom, trying to get away from the yoke of authoritarian rule and control and rule itself. The spirit of revolution continues, and it is even within our ecclesias, brothers and sisters, and that's what we're going to deal with in our second class.